Well, please, I'd invite you all to have your Bibles open at that passage we just read together earlier in our service in the letter of James and chapter 2. James and chapter 2. Now, as you know, we have been steadily working our way through this letter of James, and we have arrived at chapter 2 and verse 14. And from verse 14 and on through to the end of this chapter, uh, James is dealing with the subject of faith and works. Faith and works. And no doubt in the weeks ahead we'll spend several sessions looking at this portion of Scripture. But tonight I want us to focus on just one verse. Just one verse, verse 14. I want us to focus our minds and our hearts on the teaching that is found within James chapter 2 and verse 14. Now let me just remind you of what verse 14 says. It says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And the title for this evening's sermon is, You Must Have a Living Faith. You must have a living faith. It, James is seeking to combat dead faith. Twice in these verses that we read together earlier in our service, uh, James warns us against dead faith. He says it in verse 17. He says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And he says it again in verse 26. For as the body, apart from the spirit, is dead, so also faith, apart from work, is dead. James does not want you to have a dead faith. James says a dead faith is useless. It is pointless. You might as well not have it. No, James wants you to have a living faith. A faith that is alive within you. James wants you to have a faith that is authentic, genuine, real, true. A living faith that's alive within you. He wants you to have a faith that is animated. A faith that is vigorous. A faith that is active, a faith that produces things in your life. Now you may say, well, wait a minute. I mean, doesn't the Apostle Paul say to us that we are saved by faith alone and not by works? I mean, isn't sola fide one of the great pillars of the Reformation? Well, yes, in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul does say, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. But that is not all Paul said in that passage. The very next verse, the very next breath that comes out of Paul's mouth is this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Your salvation is not the result of your works. Your salvation is by faith alone, by the grace of God. But you were created for good works, that you should walk in them. That good works should be as natural to you as putting one foot in front of the other. Yes, we are saved by faith alone, but having been saved by faith, you must walk in good works. And yes, of course, sola fide, <laughs> faith alone, was one of the great cries of the Reformation. But even the reformers acknowledged that the evidence of faith must be seen in your life. The reformers used to say, faith alone saves, but faith that is alone saves no one. Faith alone saves, 
But faith that is alone saves no one. Genuine, living, saving faith will always lead to a changed life. The work of the gospel is always transformative. You can't truly have faith in Christ without it uh, affecting your life, without it changing your life. The gambler who comes to faith in Christ will stop gambling. The adulterer who comes to faith in Christ will stop having affairs. The gossip who comes to faith in Christ will stop spreading rumors. The heavy drinker will start drinking in moderation. The angry man will become gentle. Now for some people, that transformation happens the very moment they come to faith and their life is dramatically altered. For others, it happens more gradually over a period of time. But it happens. You cannot claim to be trusting in Christ and also say that your life has not changed. True saving faith always leads to a change in your character, a change in your behavior, a change in your outlook, a change in your life. Now why is that? Well, it is because good works inevitably flow from a living faith. Now, we're not saying that you can be saved by your own good works. Far from it. You can have all the good works in the world. But without a living faith, which has been planted into your heart, you'll never be saved. Salvation is by faith alone. But a genuine, authentic, and living faith will always reveal itself in works. Faith is the root, and the works are the fruit. I'm sure you've heard that before, but it is worth repeating and I'll repeat it again. Faith is the root and works are the fruit. Does your faith have fruit? Does your faith bear fruit? Now with all that in mind, tonight let us take a look at James chapter 2 and verse 14. And as I say, the title for the sermon this evening is you must have a living faith. You must have a living faith. But what is a living faith? What is a living faith? Well, as we look at verse 14 of James chapter 2, this verse is telling us at least three things about a living faith. And these three things are going to be our three headings for the remainder of our time this evening. First of all, a living faith is more than words. A living faith means more than words. Uh, Secondly, a living faith is always accompanied by works. A living faith is always accompanied by works. And thirdly, a living faith is the only way to save your soul. A living faith is the only way to save your soul. First of all then, A living faith, it means more than words. Just look with me at the opening words of verse 14. Just read the opening words of verse 14. And in verse 14, James says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith? If someone says he has faith. James is speaking about someone who claims to have faith, who asserts that they have faith, who professes to have faith. And James says, well, what good is that? Literally, James is asking, what do you gain if you simply say you believe? What benefit is there in merely professing faith? At what profit Is there if your faith is only words? A living faith has got to be more than that. It's got to be more than just the words that come out of your mouth. 
It's got to be more than just a profession, more than just a verbal agreement, more than just a set of uh, theological statements that you agree with. This world is full of people who said, well, I, I prayed a prayer once. I have faith. It's just words. I was at an event and I walked down the aisle to the front and I made a declaration. It's just words. What good is that? Later in this chapter, James will say, you believe that God is one, you do well. But even the demons believe and they shudder. In other words, even the demons will say, yes, there is one true living God. We know that he exists and we fear him. Even the demons will confess those things. So saying that you believe in Jesus is not enough. It's not enough just to say it. Now James has already made this point to us in his letter, hasn't he? Back in chapter 1 and verse 22, he has said that true believers must be doers of the word, not hearers only. The Christian faith is a, is a living and active faith. Believers have got to put the words of God and the commandments of God and the instructions of God into action in your life. And James has already given us two solid, real-life, practical examples of what it means to be a doer of the word. He says you've got to control your mouth, get control of your tongue. Bridle your tongue. And he says you must not show favoritism towards the rich and the powerful, especially at the expense of the poor and the weak. If you say you have faith, you should do these things. And Jesus himself. Jesus himself says what James is saying here. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 Jesus said these words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying it's got to be more than words. There are plenty of people who say, Lord, Lord. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It is not what you say. It is what you do. It's not what you profess to believe. It is the way you choose to live your life. Now, what does Jesus go on to say about people who claim to have faith, but never do the will of the Father? He says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. If your faith is only on your lips and not on your heart, and not in your life, Jesus will say, I never knew you. You say you know me, but I never knew you. And you know, despite the repeated warnings in the Bible, churches are full of people, full of people who have no true living faith at all. They say they believe in Christ. They say that they trust in Christ. They say that they follow Christ. But it's just all words. It's just all talk. Their lives are unchanged. Their lives are untouched by the gospel. There is no evidence of grace in their lives. There is no love. There is no humility. There is no gentleness. You know, I was speaking with someone 
recently, and we were, we were talking about how sometimes you meet a Christian or someone who claims to be a Christian, and they've got all the doctrines nailed down. They're almost a walking theological encyclopedia. But when you speak to them, there's just no, there's no humility. There's no, there's no sense that you're talking with a, a fellow sinner who's been saved by grace. And then there are other times you meet someone who gets all the jargon wrong. They don't know what the right words to say are. They haven't got the evangelical language down. But you know when you look into their face and when you hear them talk that they've, uh, they've a real experience of Christ and the gospel. They've got a living faith. You know, people who just talk the talk but show no devotion to do the will of God. No desire to obey the commandments of God. No eagerness to have fellowship with the Lord's people. No concern for widows and orphans. No desire to perform acts of sacrificial service to others. No commitment to prayer or to the, the prayer meetings of a church. No indication that they are mortifying sin in their lives, that they're putting sin to death or at least trying to. And they continue to be shaped by the world. They idolize the things of this world. They worship the things of this world. It is the things of this world that dictate to them how they live their lives. And whatever time they've got left over from God, well, he gets that. He gets the fag end of their time. And they just behave the same as the people of this world. They have the same attitudes as this world. They have the character of this world. They have the smell of the world on them. And yet they say, well, I have faith. I believe in Jesus. I prayed a prayer once. But it's all just words. No, no, no. A living faith must be more than words, says James. You can't just say it. You've got to do it. So let me ask all of you that are here tonight. Do you have a living faith in your heart? A living faith in your life? I'm not asking you whether you say you believe in Christ. I'm not asking you whether you claim to have trusted in Christ. I'm not asking you whether you once made a profession of faith in Christ. I'm asking you right here tonight, do you have a living faith in your heart right now? Are you doing the will of your Father? Are you acting in obedience to his word? Or is it all just words to you? Here in James chapter 2 verse 14, James says, a living faith, it is more than words. That's the first thing verse 14 is saying to us. It is saying a living faith must mean more than words. But of course, verse 14 is teaching us more than that. So secondly, as we look at verse 14, we are also being taught that a living faith must be accompanied by works. A living faith is always accompanied by works. Now just look at verse 14 again. Let's just read verse 14 again. And in verse 14 James says, Now what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Now the implication is clear. That a true, genuine, living faith ought to be accompanied by works. That the one produces the other. That it is inevitable, it is unavoidable, it is inescapable that if you have a true and living faith in your life, that it will produce works. Now what does James mean by this word, works? What sort of works is James speaking about? Well, literally means activities or jobs or, or tasks or deeds. But notice James writes it in the plural. Works plural. In other words, there isn't just one specific thing that you must do in order to show that you have a true and living faith. No, a true living faith produces many works, multiple works in your life. That faith 
produces numerous works. Faith produces lots and lots and lots of works in your life. So you can't just say, well, I pray every day, so therefore I've got living faith. Because it's more than one thing. You can't just say, well, I read my Bible, so I must have a living faith. You can't just say, well, I attend church with my family, so I must have a living faith. You can't just pick one thing and say, there you go, there's evidence. Evidence that I have a living faith. No, James says, a true living faith in Christ produces works, plural. The Apostle Paul says you've got to walk in your works. Ephesians, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul talks also about good works, plural. Yes, he says we are, we are saved by faith alone, and that is a gift of God, but we are saved for good works, plural. He says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. They should be, they should be our daily experience. It should be as natural to us that we produce good works as it is to walk down the street. And it's also the teaching of Jesus. It's not only the teaching of James, not only the teaching of the Apostle Paul, it is the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus sets out the nature of the kingdom of God. And Jesus sets out what he expects from those who belong to the kingdom of God. And he says, let your light shine before others. That they may see your good works. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Not glory to you for your good works, but glory to the Father in heaven. And Jesus himself demonstrated a life of good works. And in John chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus said, I have shown you many good works which are from the Father. In Acts chapter 9, Dorcas is commended for a life that is full of good works and acts of charity. In Paul's letter to Titus, he speaks of those who profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable. <clears throat> Disobedient, unfit for any good work. Then in the same letter, Paul says to Titus, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. Are you a model of good works? Could people look at you and say, now that's a model I want to copy. There's an example I want to follow. That person's a model of good works. The writer of Hebrews says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works. Do you consider it? Do you think about it? We're commanded in Scripture to consider how we can go about stirring one another up to good works. Do you see the New Testament repeatedly tells us that our lives are to be full of good works? We ought to live lives that are full of kindness and mercy, and justice, and righteousness, and blamelessness, and love, and compassion, and truth, and holiness, and sacrifice, and generosity, and patience, and forgiveness. In short, if you have a living faith in your heart, you should live a life that is in conformity to the will of God. But why? Why should our lives be filled with good works? Well, it's most certainly not so that we can earn our place in heaven. We do not earn our salvation through our good works. We've already said salvation is by faith in Christ alone. And the moment we start to think that our good works are the basis of our salvation, that is the moment we turn all of our good works into bad works. Because the very second we think that by doing these things we're earning our place in heaven... At that very moment, our good works become polluted and poisoned with all of our pride. So no, 
That's not the reason we live a life of good works. It is not to earn our salvation. But let me give you six reasons. Six reasons why we should live lives that are full of good works. First of all, you should do it out of thankfulness to God. Plain and simple. Do it out of thankfulness to God. For he has given you life. He has given you breath. And he has given you the common graces of food on your tables and clothes on your back and a roof over your head and a family that loves you and friends that like you. But more than that, if you belong to him, you've been saved by grace. At great cost, the cost of the blood of his only beloved son. So therefore, out of gratitude to him, you should seek to live a life that pleases him. So have a life that is full of good works out of thankfulness to God for all that he has done. And if for no other reason than that, that would be enough. But let me give you a second reason. Good works helps to bolster your assurance of faith. It helps to bolster your assurance of faith. As we've said before, good works are evidence that there is true, genuine, authentic, living faith within your heart. Now, yes, it is an evidence to others who are looking. But it's also an evidence to you. It's an evidence to you that the faith that you have is true and real because you can see it in your own changed life. The third reason that we should have good works is that good works will encourage your fellow believers We just read it a moment ago, but let me read it to you again. The writer of Hebrews said, Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. If you are performing good works in your life, you will encourage your fellow believer, your brother, your sister to perform works uh, that are good. What better way to stir one another up than to lead by example? Fourthly, good works gives credence to the gospel. It gives credence to the gospel. In other words, when people see that the life of believers are full of good works, they are far more likely to listen to the gospel that we profess. They can see the impact that the gospel has had on your life when you show them that your life has changed. Fifth, good works also silence the critics of the gospel. It is much harder for them to deny the reality of the gospel when they see people of the gospel doing good works performed by the people of God. As the Apostle Peter says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles. And when he uses that word Gentiles in this context, he's meaning unbelievers. Keep your conduct amongst unbelievers honorable. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And sixth, doing good works will glorify your Father in heaven. We've already quoted from Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. But let me now also quote Jesus in John chapter 15, verse 8. Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. When you bear the fruit of your faith, you glorify the Father in heaven. Do you see why your life should be filled with good works? Not so that you can earn your place in heaven. Not so that you can earn your salvation. No, no, no. You're not saved by works. But good works show that you are thankful to God. They bolster your assurance. They encourage your fellow believer They give credence to the gospel. They silence the critics of the gospel. And they glorify your Father in heaven. So let me ask you again tonight. Is your life full of good works? You know, sometimes in our reformed evangelical world, the word works is almost a dirty word. We recoil from it because we want to defend the principle that we are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, on, the, on Scripture alone. 
We want to shun any idea of a works-based religion because we've been down that road and it, and it ends in dead religion. But sometimes I wonder. I wonder whether that is also a convenient excuse for a life that is empty of good works. Is your life empty of good works? Is your life empty of good deeds? Is your life empty of the things we've been talking about tonight? If your life is, if your life is completely empty, I mean, if there, if there is not a single good work that you can point to, you have to ask yourself whether there is any living faith within you at all. Here in James chapter 2, James says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? James says you must have a living faith. And first he says that a living faith means more than words. Secondly, he has said that a living faith must be accompanied by works. And now thirdly, and finally, he says, a living faith is the only way to save your soul. A living faith is the only way to save your soul. Just look at verse 14 again. Let's just read verse 14 one more time. And in verse 14, James says, Now what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Can that faith save him? And the implication is no, it cannot. It cannot save him. A faith which never ever produces any works is a dead faith. And a dead faith cannot save anyone. But by implication, a faith which does, a faith which does produce good works is a living faith. And a living faith can save your soul. A living faith leads to salvation. A true, genuine, authentic faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can save your soul. A living faith can redeem your life from the pit. A living faith can take you into eternity. A living faith can make you a citizen of the kingdom of God. A living faith will call you out of the darkness of this world and into his marvelous light. Now don't misunderstand me. Works alone won't save you. We've said it before, but it is worth repeating. If you don't have any genuine faith, it doesn't matter how many good works you perform. It doesn't matter how many acts of charity you carry out. It doesn't matter how many deeds of mercy you may produce in your life. It doesn't matter whether you volunteer at the local food bank. It doesn't matter whether you help asylum seekers to speak English. It doesn't matter whether you donate your money to a worthy cause. None of these things matter if you don't have true living faith. Because works alone will not save you. But likewise, a dead faith which never produces any good works, well, that won't save you either. A lifeless, meaningless, empty faith will not save your soul. It's not good enough to say, merely to say that you believe. It's not good enough just to say you've got faith. You've got to produce fruit. Your faith must produce good works. The Apostle Paul called these things the work of faith. And he called it the obedience of faith. Then and only then can you say, I have a living faith. Then and only then can you say, my soul is saved. And your soul needs to be saved. Because every person in this world is born with a sinful nature. You don't need to train a child to be impatient. You don't need to train a child to be selfish. You don't need to train a child to get angry. You don't need to train a child to be disobedient. Now, of course, a parent can make those characteristics either better or worse. But the point is, the monster of sin is already alive within every child that is born into this world. 
<clears throat> and as we grow from infancy through adolescence and up into adulthood, uh, we may become better or worse at, at hiding the worst elements of our sinful nature, but it's still there. It's still there. Idolatry, blasphemy, dishonesty, greed, envy, lust. Those sins don't go away. They're there. There's not a day that goes by when we don't sin by breaking a commandment of God. And we're all under the wrath of God because we've broken his law. And one day we must all meet our maker. And one way or another, the penalty for our guilt must be paid. And no amount of good works in your life without faith can pay for it. But thanks be to God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And his perfect life and his perfect obedience has paid the penalty for all those who will trust in him. For all those who will have faith in him. He has paid the penalty in his body on the cross. With his own shed blood. And his resurrection confirms that the penalty that he has paid has been accepted by the Father. And all you need to do is repent of your sins and believe. And to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's got to be a living faith. You can't just say it. It's got to be a living faith in your life. So do you have that faith tonight? Do you have that real living faith? Do you? Show me the evidence. It's got to be more than just words. You can't just say that you believe these things. You've got to show it. You've got to show it in a changed life. There's got to be works of faith in your life. You have to show the evidence of a changed life, of, of a transformed life. Now, as I say, for some people that can be dramatic and instantaneous, and for others it takes a period of time, but every life that is touched by the gospel must be changed. Because the gospel changes people. Jesus changes people. There's got to be works of grace in your life. You know, this morning, Walter was leading us in the doctrine of the church. And I tell you one of the evidences. Of a true living faith in a person. Is that he or she will love the church. This morning Walter reminded us the church is a family. And we should treat it like a family. Not like a bed and breakfast. It's not a place just to attend on occasions. For nourishment and shelter. It's not a place just to be passing the time of day with strangers. It is a permanent home for brothers and sisters in the Lord. It is a place of love. It is a place of unity. It is a place where you will be fed. It is a place where you will be brought up in the faith. It is a place of safety. It is a place of service where you serve. These are some of the evidences of a true living faith. And I have lost count. Of the number of people over the years that I have met. Who tell me that they have faith. But they have zero interest. In the church. They just float from one church to another church to another church. Or they sit at home. They listen to sermons on the internet. They never settle down. They never commit themselves to the life of a local church. They never show the slightest bit of interest in the spiritual welfare of other believers. And they're happy to see other people doing all the work in the kingdom. They never lift a finger to help. Is there any living faith in such a person? <clears throat> this is no secondary issue. And this is no trivial matter. James says your salvation is at stake. 
This is a salvation issue. Because if you claim to have faith, but you never have any works, James says your faith is dead. It is a dead faith. Your faith is empty. Your faith is meaningless. And James asked, will such a faith save you? And the answer is a resounding no. It won't save you. A dead faith, an empty faith, a meaningless faith will not save you. You know, there is none so far from the kingdom of God as those who think they belong to it when they don't. And there is none so far from eternal life as those who say that they've got faith when they don't. And churches up and down this land and churches across the world are filled with people who say that they've got faith. But it's all just words. A living faith has to be accompanied by works. Because only a living faith can save your soul. So what about you tonight? Do you have that living faith? Do you have that true, genuine, authentic, living faith? Or is it all just words? A living faith means more than words. You can't just say you believe. You can't just say that you trust in Christ. A living faith will always be accompanied by works. Now, we could all do better. I'm I'm sure that that's right. I'm not asking you whether you are perfect, as your life is perfectly filled with perfect works. But are there any? You're not saved by those works. But works are evidence that there is a true living faith within you. Faith is the root. But works are the fruit. It is essential. It is vital. It is crucial. You must have a living faith. So then tonight, as we've looked at James chapter 2, verse 14, James has shown us that a living faith means more than just words. A living faith must always be accompanied by works. And a living faith is the only thing that will save your soul. Let's pray. Lord God and our loving Heavenly Father, uh, once again your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts right to our very souls. Lord, we all confess that we could do more that our lives could be more filled with good works. Uh, But, Father, we ask for your help. We ask that your Spirit will work within us. So, although we may say we are not what we ought to be, we can at least look back and say, but we're not what we used to be. Uh, We can see evidence within our lives of, of a true living faith within us. Uh, Lord, We ask that we might do these things because it pleases you. Uh, We ask that we might do these things so that it might encourage one another, that we might stir one another up to love and to good works. But Lord, as we do all these things, we pray that we'll never fall into the trap of pride, the trap of thinking that by our good works we are earning our place in glory, that we are saving ourselves, Lord, We thank you that salvation is all of your doing. For if it were of our doing, none of us would be saved. But Lord, help us to accompany that living faith with good works. And we ask that it might commend the gospel. That it might silence the critics of the gospel. And we pray that in all of this, that you might be honoured, that you might be glorified. And we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen.